Hello students, welcome to Prelims Least Initiative of IAS by Heart. Here we will discuss about 500 most probable questions which can appear in the UPSC Prelims 2021. I want you to answer the questions in the comment box below and uh, I would like this session to be as interactive as possible. Okay, without further delay, let's jump into the questions. Let's look at the first question. The first question is about the motion of thanks. The address of the president is discussed in both the houses of parliament on a motion called the motion of thanks. Okay. No amendments related to president's address can be introduced in the motion of thanks. Okay. At the end of the discussion, the motion is put to vote. Okay. So this question has featured in our series because recently the motion of thanks was passed by the parliament and uh, most of the opposition parties boycotted this motion. Okay, so the answer to this question is answer C, 1 and 3 only because amendments can be introduced in the motion of thanks. Uh, before we uh, see what motion of thanks is all about, let's see what this president address is about. Okay, so president address to the members of parliament is guided by article 87 of the constitution. This is an annual event. And it happens during the first session after every general election or the first session of each year. Uh, pr uh, president will address the joint sitting of both the houses and summon the members of the parliament. No other business is transacted till the president has addressed both the houses assembled together. Okay. You might have a question about what will happen if there is no Lok Sabha. I mean, if the Lok Sabha is dissolved. Okay. In those times, the Rajya Sabha can have its session without the president's address. Has it happened before? Yes, it has. In 1977, during the dissolution of Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha had its session on February without the president's address. So there is a president as well. In this case, the first session after each general election to the Lok Sabha, the president addresses both the houses assembled together after, after not before, after the members have subscribed the subscribe to the oath as well as uh, after the speaker has been elected. Okay, so the president's address, what will it contain? It will contain the statement of policy of the government and it is draft by the government itself. So uh, it will essentially contain the various activities and achievements of the governments during the previous year, as well as it will set out the policies, projects, programs, and the vision of the government in years to come. It will also indicate what uh, legislative business that the government has decided to propose in the upcoming session. Okay, now let's look at what the motion of thanks is about. The address is uh, discussed, the address of the president is discussed on the motion of thanks. Okay, so uh, the, all the members will thank the president for his address. Here they can have discussions and debates and criticize the government for its lapses and failures. Generally, three days are allotted for the discussion on the motion of thanks. If any of the amendments are put forward and accepted, then the motion of thanks is adopted. So, motion of thanks is open to amendments and all. Amendments may refer to matters contained in the address as well as to matters which, in the opinion of the member, the address has failed to mention. For example, at this time, the address has failed to mention the farmers' protests. So, there was a boycott by the opposition. So, you can see that uh, the, uh, the opposition parties can also discuss about this thing. At the end of the discussion, the motion is put to vote. And uh, if this motion is defeated, it is deemed that the ruling government has failed or the ruling government has lost the majority in the house. Okay. So let's move on to the next question. The next question is from economy. Here we are talking about consumer welfare fund. It was in news recently. So it was set up under the Consumer Protection Act 2019. And uh, the fund has been set up by the Department of Consumer Affairs for spreading consumer literacy and awareness. Okay, so this Consumer Welfare Fund was set up under GST Act, okay, not under Consumer Protection Act, as well as it has been set up by the Department of Expenditure and not the Department of Consumer Affairs. So the answer to this question is neither one nor two. We'll see more about this. Consumer Welfare Fund was set up under the Central Goods and Services Tax Act 2017. You might have seen about the National Anti-Profiteering Authority 
which was set up under this act the money which is not spent under NAPA will be sent to the consumer welfare fund okay so this was set up by the department of revenue previously i told you i think uh, department of expenditure sorry it's actually department of revenue in the ministry of finance and it is operated by department of consumer affairs in the question we can see that it is given it was set up by department of consumer affairs that is wrong it is set up by the department of revenue in ministry of finance okay and uh, the overall objective is to provide financial assistance to promote and protect the welfare of the consumers okay uh, let's see how the fund is utilized it is utilized by creating consumer law chairs centers of excellence in institutions and universities etc and it is also used to spread consumer literacy and awareness okay moving on to the next question in uh, international relation this talks about the open sky treaty okay which of the following statements about open sky treaty is not true it allows its signatories to monitor arms development by conducting surveillance flights unarmed over each other's territories yes this is what open sky treaty deals with it was signed in 1992 and went into effect in 2002 okay recently russia withdrew from the open sky treaty after ussa's exit yeah that is the reason why it was in news india is a member of this treaty okay in the question they have asked about which of the following is not true so the answer to this question is option d india is not a member of this treaty okay let's see more about this treaty russia recently announced it was pulling out of the open sky treaty because of the withdrawal of the united states so open sky treaty essentially allows for unarmed surveillance flights over its member countries over there are 34 signatories to this pact and uh, all these signatories can undertake unarmed surveillance flights over other signatories here the us left the open sky arms control and verification treaty in november this move was uh, done by the trump administration and uh, russia in a statement said that moscow had made specific proposals to other members to mitigate against the impact of the us exit but those proposals were not backed by the washington's allies so if we look at this treaty if we look at this treaty the us has used it more intensively than russia for example between 2002 and 2016 the us flew 196 flights over russia compared to 71 flights flown by russia in united states okay so uh, let's see who are all the members the entire europe usually the most of europe russia united states and canada were the members but uh, since uh, us has withdrawn we have only these members right now it was signed in 1992 and it came into effect in 2002 so it allows its 34 signatory countries to monitor arms development by conducting surveillance flights over each other's territories so this is uh, this is done to have a mutual understanding or a mutual supervision over each other okay the treaty established an aerial surveillance system for its participants both russia and usa are signatories were signatories of the treaty and india is not a member of this treaty at any point of time okay so let's move on to the next question the next question is about reports and indices and uh, here we have uh, we are going to talk about the global investment trends monitor report of 2021 released by untad india witnessed a 13% year on year fall on fdi inflows in 2020 whereas china's fdi inflows rose by 4% okay uh, this is the year of pandemic and uh, fdi inflows overall reduced drastically but yet india and china both of the countries witnessed an increase in fdi inflows so this statement is false it was not a fall it was a rise for india advanced economies like the uk and italy saw an over 100% crash each in fdi inflows yeah this is true developed economies uh, failed to attract new fdi inflows 
so the answer to this question is two only let's see about the report according to the recent investment trends monitor report issued by umtat global fdi collapsed by 42% this is an unprecedented fall so such a low level was last seen in the 1990s and it is more than 30% below the investment decline that followed in 2008 2009 global financial crisis so the situation right now is worse than the 20 2008 financial crisis okay so but uh, let's see the global trend india and china india witnessed a 13% year on year rise okay you might uh, expect that uh, fdi for india would have fallen but it has actually increased the highest among key nations in fdi inflows and but china's rose by 4% but in absolute terms china remained way ahead with an inflow of 163 billion dollars whereas india's inflows were at 57 billion dollars year on year rise in, on year on year rise we lead china but on absolute terms we are far behind china okay you have to understand one thing uh, we saw many reports and how the richest of the rich increased their wealth by up to 35% during this pandemic so when the rich get really richer they will come back and invest in developing countries so that's why we can see that uh, countries like india and china have increased fdi flows because the rich will put their money again in investment only for example in advanced economies that is not the case they had seen a crash 100% crash in fdi inflows russia but 96% drop in fdi inflows similarly all other countries clocked a decline but developing economies they drew as much as 72% of global fdi in 2020 their highest share on record so see uh, as the rich get richer for example uh, we can take tesla elon musk became the richest person during the pandemic and uh, what happened then he planned to open a factory in india in bangalore in bangalore so this is what happens when these guys get rich they will invest again in developing countries and they will plan to expand their business okay so the future projection according to the report is that uh, the future also looks uh, dim the uncertainty will hamper global fdi inflows and uh, it will threaten the sustainable recovery prospects okay let's move on to the next question question number 5 this is about glacial lakes okay there has been a rapid increase in the number of glacial lakes due to a retreat in glaciers co- caused by global warming yes due to increase in temperature there has been increase in the number of glacial lakes due to the melting of snow okay the kedarnath tragedy in 2013 had involved the breach in a large glacial lake in garhwal himalayas garhwal himalayas is nothing but the himalayas in uttarakhand so this is also true the answer to this question is both 1 and 2 option c so let's see about what glacial lakes are so glacial lakes are typically formed at the foot of the glacier once you have a glacier like this uh, as uh, the temperature increases the glacier at the top will uh, melt and they will form a lake here all these deposits will come and settle down here and but once the once the lake gets too much water in it it will start to overflow and uh, the villages in the surrounding areas might face floods because of this okay i have added a video in the next slide which will help you understand it better okay we'll see uh, how these as glaciers move and flow they will erode the soil and sediment around them leaving depressions and these depressions will be filled up by the melt water from the glaciers okay and uh, there has been increase in the number of glacial lakes according to recent studies and this is because mainly because of warming temperatures and global warming and this can cause large scale flooding and destruction the kedarnath uh, tragedy in 2013 is an example and even the recent tragedy in uttarakhand in champoli district is an example of the glacial lake outburst flood we'll see what glacial lake outburst flood is so the past of uttarakhand witnessed massive flooding 
this month and uh, glof is when water dammed by the glacier is released see what happens here the water from the melting glacier gets filled and as the water overflows and water starts pouring out of the ice dam and it will flood the entire village in the downstream all the people living in the downstream are affected by these floods this is what happened in 2013 and this is what is happening right now in uttarakhand as well so we have uh, let's see what are the mitigation measures that uh, our government had taken for to control this tragedy mitigation measures uh, this is channeling potential floods to manage lakes structurally the ndma recommends reducing the volume of water so how can we reduce this volume of water we can use controlled breaching so we saw that that the water level increases and then it floods so is there a way to control this or to reduce this volume of water that can be done by controlled breaching that is we do it intentionally and capture the excess water that is one way or uh, pumping or siphoning out water that can also be done or making a tunnel through moraine barrier or a or an under or under an ice dam so what they are saying is we put a hole in here we take the water out in a safer way so that uh, such uh, tragedies does not occur other mitigation measures include enhancing early warning systems so this is uh, the population in the vicinity area who are very vulnerable to such disasters are warned using these early warning systems training local manpower and uh, use of comprehensive alarm systems and uh, remote monitoring using satellites and all we can identify the potentially dangerous lakes and take mitigation measures so these are all the steps which are given for us to prepare for such a disaster moving on question number 6 this is about the sandus messaging platform which was launched by the government very recently it is a government inter instant messaging system that can be used only for official purposes by government employees so uh, here they have used the word only so we have to be really cautious when words like these are used because uh, this messaging system is open for all this is not restricted to official purposes only or for government employees only so first statement is wrong and second statement it allows a user to mark a message as confidential which will allow the recipient to be made aware the message should not be shared with others yes this is a unique feature which the messaging platform offers here you can mess mark a message as confidential so oh, the other side will also know that it should not be shared with others and then it was launched by national informatic center on the lines of whatsapp that is also true national informatic center comes under the ministry of information technology electronics information and technology so the answer to this question is option c 2 and 3 only let's see more about this national informatic center has launched an instant messaging platform called sandus on the lines of whatsapp so we have created a, an indigenous app to avoid our reliance on whatsapp uh, telegram and other foreign apps so sandus app is a government instant messaging system that can be used for official or casual use okay can be used by government employees or public users having a valid mobile number or email id that's all you need similar to what whatsapp is doing so it offers uh, features like a group making broadcasting message message forwarding emojis so everything what whatsapp can offer is also offered here so this is the app you can see here i also request you to check it out you can download this in the play store it allows uh, the Uh, this one is uh, marking certain messages as confidential so it is not shared with others that is a, a feature that is being given here like we have seen and uh, let's move on to the next question question number 7 matua community recently seen in news belongs to which of the following state so this community is seen in the context of west bengal answer is a let's see more about this community 
So the Mathuas traced their ancestry to East Bengal, and many of them entered West Bengal after the partition of 1947. Okay, and after the formation of Bangladesh in 1971. So the very important population which can benefit from CAA is the Mathuas of West Bengal. Most of them do not have a citizenship, and this act can actually help them getting a valid citizenship. So the background. Binapani Devi, also known as Borama, is the matriarch of the Mathua community. So this community has a matriarch, and uh, she was also given the Bengal's highest civilian award few years ago by Mamta Banerjee, the present Chief Minister of West Bengal. And uh, the Mathua Mahasangha is a religious reform movement and also a sect which was formed by Harichand Thakur in East Bengal in the mid 1800s. So this is a 200 old, 200 year old institution, a religious sect, okay. And uh, Harichand's grandson P R Thakur established West Bengal West Bengal's Thakur Nagar as headquarters of the sect after 1947. So this is what you have to know. They were recently in the news because they are the deciding factor in many assembly seats in West Bengal. We know that uh, elections are due in West Bengal. so that's why this community is being talked about in the west bengal media though there is no official count available the community leaders put their population at 3 crore which makes them a numerically significant population as far as the elections are concerned okay let's move on to the next question this is in art and culture tol pavak kut form of shadow puppetry is popular in the areas of Okay, here they have given districts like Bhojpur, Boxer, Gopalganj. You have uh, even though if you don't know which districts they are popular in, you can just go by the states. They are talking about Bihar, Odisha, Tamil Nadu, and Kerala. And uh, Tol Pavak Kuthu is famous in Kerala. So this is the origin of this art form. The answer is B. Palakkad, Thirissur, and Malappuram districts of Kerala. Tolpava Kuthu is a form of shadow puppetry that is practiced in Kerala. Actually, you can uh, break these words. Tol means skin. Okay, so skin is used. Pava or bavam means expressions. Okay, Kuthu means or a fun activity. Okay, it is practiced in Kerala in India. Re- it was recently in the news because. The famous shadow leather puppets will tell stories of epic Ramayana with the help of robots. Okay, they have planned to use uh, robots in place of these leather puppets. So, see, this is how uh, the puppetry is done. They make this uh, puppets with the help of a goat skin, usually. This is how the images are formed. Okay, moving on. Uh, Tol Pavak Kuthu is performed using leather puppets, and it is a ritual dedicated to Badra Kali, goddess Badra Kali in Devi temples. Okay, the art form is popular in Palakkad, Thrissur, Malappuram districts of Kerala, as we have seen, and it is uh, believed to have originated in the 9th century AD. And uh, most of the time, it uses uh, epics or stories from Amber Ramayana. Okay, these pu- puppets are made out of deer skin. they used it to be made out of deer skin but now are typically made from goat skin but uh, recently they are introducing robots okay so the puppets are painted in vegetable dyes as these dyes last long okay that's all we have with respect to this topic we'll move on let's see this question paramarsh a ugc scheme is associated with mentoring nac accreditation aspirant institutions improving digital teacher training infrastructure online pool of educational resources mental health counseling for the students i want you to give your answers in the comment box below the answer to this question is option a mentoring nac accreditation aspirant institutions so this was launched by ministry of hrd a ugc scheme This is for mentoring NAC accreditation aspirant institutions by another well-performing institution, which aims to upgrade 
the academic performance of these institutions. So this will be operationalized through a hub and spoke model. Hub and spoke model is nothing but a good, a well-performing institution will guide a aspirant institution and uh, many other institutions in that vicinity. So one hub is there and the spokes are formed. So this is the hub and spoke model. Okay. So the mentee institution will also have increased exposure because of this uh, mentoring and uh, they will adapt to better practices very quicker. Okay. So this will also help them focus on uh, extracurricular aspects, uh, teacher learning, teacher training, evaluation, innovation and research, etc. This scheme is also expected to have a major impact in addressing and improving the quality of higher education in India. That is the objective of this scheme. Okay, moving on. The final question for this question, uh, session is about the non-personal data. Which of the following is not an example of non-personal data? I want you to give your answers in the comment section. So non-personal data is nothing but a data from which an individual cannot be directly identified. Okay. So let's see the options, census and demographic data, bank account information, metadata collected by ride hailing apps, internet usage data collected by ISPs, internet service providers. The answer to this question is B, bank account information. It is a personal data. All the other things are non-personal data. Here you might get confused whether census or demographic data is uh, personal or not. Uh, when a data is taken for a community as a whole, a single person cannot be identified. So demographic data or anything that has to do with demographics are usually, uh, they usually come under non-personal data. And uh, the metadata uh, collected by ride hailing apps, they are usually the traffic data or uh, your uh, movement activities. But uh, these cannot be identified with you. Somebody with your phone might also use it so they might not know the person who is using it, but only the data that the, your phone is using. So uh, one cannot identify a, uh, a single individual with this data. As well as internet usage data also collects the data used by your computer, not by you. You may have used it, your friends may have used it, your father may have used it. So this might not uh, get help, you, help them get any personal information about you. So this is also a non-personal data. So let's see why non-personal data was in news. So recently a committee of experts on non-personal data governance framework was formed. Okay. It was headed by Infosys co-founder Chris Gopalakrishnan. This was formed to suggest how non-personal data generated in the country can be allowed to be used by various companies and entities for their growth. Okay. So non-personal data, as I have said, it does not contain any personally identifiable information. But uh, we saw bank account is a very personal information. It has your name, your card details, everything about that is unique. So uh, they can, uh, with bank account information, one can easily identify the individual behind that. Okay. But non-personal data means no individual or living person can be identified by looking at such data. So that kind of bulk data which uh, does not uh, point to a particular person is called non-personal data. So we saw about this committee and uh, this committee has classified non-personal data into three main categories, namely public non-personal data. So public non-personal data refers to the data collected by the government, for example, through uh, census and uh, other demographic data collected by the government of India, they come under this category. Community non-personal data, this is the data usually collected by municipal cooperations, which collect uh, the data of the community as a whole. Okay. And uh, private non-personal data. This is uh, the data which is collected by private entities like uh, Google, Amazon, uh, where they see your uh, uh, internet usage patterns or your interests, etc. These are private non-personal data. So that's all we have for here, for this session. I kindly request you to ask any questions you have in the comment box below. So this is a quick recap about what we have seen. So we had seen about the motion of thanks in the first question, uh, article 87, etc. And then we saw about consumer welfare fund. 
which was set up under the gst act and uh, we saw about open sky treaty and uh, how uh, both russia and uh, us has uh, expressed interest to withdraw from this treaty us has withdrawn and russia is in the process of withdrawal so right now russia is still a member it might change in the future okay see to that see to any latest developments with regarding to open sky treaty and then we also saw about investment trends monitor report where uh, investments for developing countries had increased and their share in total fdis has increased though the total fdi has fallen 42% okay and uh, fifth we saw about glacial lakes the recent floods in uttarakhand and uh, what was the reason behind that and uh, what are the various mitigation measures that ndma has to uh, tackle such a disaster and then we saw about uh, sandus app launched by the government we, we saw about madhuva communities of bengal we have we saw toll power cut of kerala and uh, paramash scheme of ugc to mentor uh, aspirant institutions who are uh, willing to get an nac accreditation that we saw and we also saw about non personal data and the uh, chris gopal krishnan committee okay so do you have any questions i would be happy to answer any of your questions please uh, put them in the comment box below and please uh, stay tuned for the upcoming sessions i would like to thank you for this session we will see in a, another video thank you